Hello, welcome to this the next spotlight. My name is Joanna Burke and I'm the principal investigator for the Shane Project, Sexual Harms and Medical Encounters. And today I'm just really incredibly excited to be able to speak to Gethin Rees, who is a sociologist at Newcastle University. And he got his PhD in science and technology at the University of Edinburgh and a postgraduate certificate in academic practice at the University of Southampton. But of course, for us, for us, the Shane Project, we really know him because of his fantastic work on doctors and um, the examination of uh, victims of um, rape and sexual assault. He's also done quite a lot of work on nursing and sexual assault and some fascinating stuff on sleep medicine and sexual assault. So I really think uh, we may not have time to talk about that. So just take a look at that um, uh, at those, those articles. Um, and I just discovered today that he is also the co-founder of the it's an awkward title, um, co-founder of Comparative Analysis in Rape Research Network, which is an interdisciplinary network that looks at um, uh, the treatment of rape victims by criminal justice personnel. So welcome, uh, Gethin. It's really thrilled to be able to talk to you. Before we actually go on and talk about your actual research, I think People listening to these um, little short videos might be interested to know just a little bit about, you know, how you came into this field, your sort of training and academic background. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an absolute honour to be here. I mean, uh, the work that's been done uh, by the Shane Centre, your work is obviously legendary in the area, but the work by the centre, the new work we're discussing with uh, some of the, uh, uh, in my role as an associate member is absolutely fascinating so I'm really chuffed to be here today um, and just on the uh, the international grouping uh, the acronym is CAIRN C-A-I-R-R-N it was it's because there's two Scottish or people who were based in Scotland when we were developing that whole idea of CAIRN was was why it's got such an awkward title absolutely anyway yes to answer your question um, so yeah so I trained as a, a sociologist I'm an undergraduate sociology degree at the uh, University of York um, and while I was there, uh, I took a module uh, on the sociology of science and science technology. And the, the one particular week in this module that I was taking was a really focused on uh, the special, uh, an, a, a copy or an issue of, a special issue of Social Studies of Science, which is a, a journal, um, uh, a regularly published journal published by SAGE. Um, which focuses particularly on science technology studies. And this was the a special issue that was published in 1998 that focused on the O.J. Simpson trial as a particular trial in which uh, genetic technologies, forensic genetic technologies were basically being understood uh, in a sort of public understanding of science way, presented to the public through the, the celebrity and the, the large scale trial of of the of, of OJ Simpson. And so uh, scholars like Sheila Jasanoff, Michael Lynch, Simon Cole, all published articles on the OJ Simpson trial um, from their various particular standpoints within within the discipline. Um, and I was absolutely fascinated. Um, little side issue the how the informal and the formal come together my partner at the time was uh, she was training to be a chemist uh, she was a chemistry student with an idea of going on to become a forensic scientist herself so we had lots of sort of conversations over dinner about forensic science i was coming from a social scientific angle she's coming from a natural sciences angle so uh, that made up most of our uh, my undergraduate degree um, discussing about that. So uh, I and I just kept being interested in uh, forensic science and, and sociologically understanding it. And so to do further research, I had to obviously I, I needed to apply for funding um, to do my master's degree and my PhD. So I applied to the Economic and Social Research Council for one plus three funding uh, to look specifically at forensic science uh, at Edinburgh in the science studies unit at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so during my MA um, and I was developing a project um, not actually on the sexual offences material um, 
as a as most I'll, I'll probably talk about STS a lot today. So science technology studies, um, as most STS uh, scholars end up doing, I was really des I was really planning to do a lab ethnography. So going into a forensic science laboratory and following the scientists as they do their practice. Um, and that was all going absolutely fine. The plans were getting in place. But at the same time, uh, so we're talking about 2004, 2005, 2006, there were a lot of discussions about the introduction of market, of marketizing forensic science. Um, and a lot of the organizations, the laboratories I was beginning to have very productive conversations with were getting cold feet about the, the situation. They didn't really need another outsider um, coming in and poking their nose at what was happening. Um, so very soon, uh, towards the end of the beginning, so the middle of the first year of my PhD proper, um, we had a sort of crisis meeting about, OK, the project is not happening as we planned. What should we do? And the legal scholar who was part of my PhD team at that time, um, uh, Victor Tadros, um, was working on some sexual assault uh, related issues and um, particularly around intoxication and he just asked have you thought about sexual violence and the forensic intervention towards sexual violence and being you know male being uh, brought up in a culture where masculinity does not touch upon um, sexual violation it's the as um, Shariah Taran talks about it's one of the uh, I mean privileges of being male I hadn't um, and so he started asking me some questions and he gave me some literature, the attrition rate work of, say, Liz Kelly and Jenny Temkin and the, the, the classic um, uh, 90 studies. And um, I got absolutely punched in the gut. There's no other way of describing it apart from that. Um, not only was I seeing this uh, highly problematic issue, I was reflecting on it, given my own experiences, uh, my own teenage experiences, relationships, um, and really reflecting on how problematic hegemonic masculinity is into this broader discussion about um, violation. But at the same time, the literatures, the sort of governmental literatures, the grey literatures that I was also reading were all very positive, like forensic science and forensic medicine was the answer. And so it really set up this sort of wonderful problematic for me um, at the time to do something that would be sort of personally highly satisfying, but also, you know, societally really important to sort of go in with this sort of STS mindset and set of questions and set of tools and to say, OK, what is happening? What can forensic science and forensic medicine offer? Um, to the solution of this problem. And, you know, we've, I've spent the next sort of 10, 15 years saying uh, not a lot, but um, the, the, that, that was the problematic. And I was very, very fortunate. I had a, a fantastic supervisory team. Um, so I trained as a sociologist, but I had Steve Sturdy and Ivan Crozier, two incredible historians of medicine, um, who provided me with a real... Um, fascination and, and interest in doc and the importance of documentary research. Uh, and while the majority of my, my, my PhD research was still interviews, I, I, I've, I've had a, a real interest in documents and I've published on the use of documents in social science research since, you know, that I think it's really important. But also uh, Sharon Cohen as a, a legal scholar who uh, really opened my eyes into thinking about gender based violence and the criminal justice response to gender based violence. And so um, I was incredibly fortunate um, to have, in my eyes, the ideal supervisory team at the time to take me through that process. Yeah, I'm really pleased you mentioned um, Ivan Crozier because, of course, he is on our advisory board. So he's been part of SHAME actually from the very first day. He's been really, really helpful to us because, I mean, like yourself, you're both really deeply embedded and deeply influential in the study of forensic medical examiners. And I was reflecting prior to coming to talk to you about the field itself, um, that um, you know, it's a sociology of scientific knowledge, but it's focusing on this one group of people, forensic medical examiners, and how that interest in that particular group of people has grown um, really hugely in the last really 
quite recently, last decade or so. Why do you think that is? Why all of a sudden are so many scholars like yourself and Ivan Crozier really interested in uh, these these doctors? I think it, it kind of goes to that duality of there is a, a huge problematic that we are all keenly aware of. And culturally, we have this perception that forensic science or science and forensic science in particular is the answer. Um, but why? Why is that not the case? Why? Why are we not then? Why isn't this a solved problem? If if science and medicine are so powerful and can achieve these things, why? Why is there this 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 tension there? And I was also I, you know, I watched the last spotlight, uh, the, the previous spotlight with Samina Muller, and we were talking a little bit actually about this question afterwards. And her her phrase um, really has stuck in my mind since. And it, it's the, it takes a village, um, and that's uh, such a core part of this. I mean, we I, I wasn't aware of the groundbreaking work of Deborah White and Janice Dumont when I started thinking about this. Um, and the, the great, incredible work they did in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but that is really, OK, they, they were not the first, you know, Steve Savage and his group um, in Portsmouth were, were the first. But to really take an, take insights from science technology studies seriously, from cultural studies, and to really drill down into what is going on in medical practice, in forensic medical practice, and open up and unpack all of the black boxes about in, literally in terms of the forensic medical kits that were being used, how evidence was being transferred, and importantly, how uh, victim survivors were being treated and, and the discretionary activities available. You know, they fundamentally opened that box. And while people have, like myself, Samina Muller, Rose Corrigan, Leslie McMillan, Others, you know, have all come to these questions independently. You know, the, the earliest materials that um, Janice and, and Deborah produced um, have been have been absolutely, you know, the, the base, the base level from which the rest of us can work. And and again, I think I think the, the, the problem, again, the, the, the reason people become so interested in this is because there is such a tension there. And I'm thinking again of Andrea, Andrea Quinlan's recent work where she's drawn attention to the, the the rape kit backlog, where, again, this sort of on one hand, wow, we have this thing that can be incredibly powerful and useful and a great judicial, judicial tool, but it's not being used or it's being used in a problematic way. It's not achieving what it's set out to do. Why? And I think it's those tensions that are incredibly rich um, and powerful for scholars. Yeah, I mean, the reason I became really fascinated by your work is I'm an historian, you're a sociologist, and I've been interested in this sort of prehistory of what you are looking at. So I'm really interested in 19th and 20th century um, history of these, of doctors and medical professionals, I should say, medical professionals and sexual assault and rape. And one of the things I think that comes up in both of our work um, me historically, but you more in the present, is this notion of role conflict, that um, police doctors, forensic medical examiners, um, and forensic nursing um, staff, they, they, they have dual role to play. On the one hand, they are caring professionals, and they have a duty of care towards the people who have been harmed, who come to them for, for help. But on the other hand, they also have a duty to the criminal justice um, system. And sometimes those two things come up in conflict. So this role conflict. And I'm, I'm curious about what your view is about that notion of role conflict today or in recent history? Skeptical um, <laughs> would be my, my the, the short answer. Um, I, I think the I think role conflict is a really interesting discursive tool for reflecting on when speaking to me in an interview or writing about one's practice uh, in a autobiography or a narrative document it's a it's a nice way to explain the tensions that they feel i tend to talk to practitioners about what they do and it's i very rarely get 
when we're in the discussion of the minutiae of the practice of what they do, I get that role conflict narrative. It's when I start asking a broader set of questions about how they feel or have attitudinal responses that this narrative discourse of role conflict comes up. So we, I, I drew again, uh, mentioning Samina Muller again, um, she developed in a very early paper um, a wonderful idea um, about this being rather than a, a, a binary a, a spectrum. And I sort of take, I took that up a little bit and, and talked about an evidential therapeutic spectrum. Um, and what I see happening, and this was very, this was really specific, actually, to uh, when I was looking at um, sexual assault nurse examiners in Ontario. But it kind of, I've, I've then been able to apply it and extrapolate it and generalize it further. But what, what I saw happening is that there's this sort of magic window of 72 hours um, because uh, genetic trace material will last something like 72 hours on the body. So within that, if, if, if a survivor comes and reports a case outside of 72 hours, then there's a lot of options on the table because, um, you know, they're not really worried about whether there's going to be any loss or contamination of, of trace material. Right. So you can provide quite a discretionary range of options to the to the survivor because, you know, it, it's more, it really is focused about providing as therapeutic an experience as possible. If you are within the magic window of 72 hours, then the scenario is somewhat different because these concerns around uh, trace material loss and contamination are, are more keen. Now, what the SANE nurses in Ontario were definitely keen to emphasize to me is they still provide the range of options and that the option to provide a um, to not bother with the sexual assault kit, to not perform a forensic intervention is absolutely still on the table. But if the survivor says, I would like a kit to be done, I'd like the forensic examination, then the whole, almost the spatiality or the attitude or the performance of the forensic process changes. It then becomes a very legal, legally le uh, legally dominated evidential collection process never fully you know you still have scope for discretion you still have space for that interaction but it becomes far more uh it's further along the uh, the evidential spectrum than maybe a case that's outside the 72 hour period um i then brought that back to uh england and wales because i was looking at the introduction of forensic nurse examiners and what i saw there was very much the, the whole attitude of the forensic nurse examiner program and the way they were being set up in sexual assault referral centers was very much driven by a fear of contamination. And so evidential narratives were absolutely key um, to the entire work process that they were working on. But again, not wholly. So it's not like there's this, um, you know, the, the binary, because again, uh, nurses were trying to say, you know, I want to make this a therapeutic as much as I want to make this an evidential process. So while they were working within this evidential, largely evidential framework, they were still finding scope for discretionary activity. So, so this, so, so this idea of role conflict, I, I, I think again, I see it as a way of post hoc rationalizing the experience. What I see happening more in, in the, the sort of reality is that people code um, the case almost and they, they classify the case. Is this a case which is within 72 hours? If so, uh, if not, then I can be quite therapeutic and make sure this person is OK. Is it within the magic window? OK, now we have to really think with our forensic hats on. And I think so. It, and, and they're just constantly shifting within that rather than saying, Am I wearing my therapeutic hat or am I wearing my 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 evidence hat? This is this is interesting. Um, and I guess this is an area that I'm not familiar with because in my period, we don't have sane nurses. Can you say a little bit about I don't know if tension is the right word, but a little bit about the relationship between the um, sane nurses and forensic medical examiners? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the same nurses, interestingly, have this uh, sort of history. I sort of, I can, I, I've tried to plot out some of this history. Um, 
but it's uh, I, I wrote I, I wrote one thing once and I had a reviewer comment which came back from I think somebody who was was a practicing sane and I'd said really they started in the sort of the the late ni- the, the the late eighties into the the early nineties and this comment came back oh no we've been practicing since the seventies and so there's this interesting sort of contentious um, uh, a narrative about when when this starts so so I, I'm I'm no longer I used to be quite certain about i know when they started but now now i'm tend to be a bit more um uncertain about that but yeah um it was a, it was a post-feminist a, a, a feminist intervention to try and stop male um doctors essentially uh, being involved in uh, uh rape interventions the uh, doctors didn't really want to do it um and even though obviously they like the money that came with you know, being able to to drop in and do this kind of work, and of course, the feminist argument was we, we shouldn't be doing this work anyway. Um, so, a specialist um, uh, nurse examiner was sort of introduced with all the usual tensions that play out between medicine and, and nursing when when new interventions and substitution of interventions take place. Um, that basically said that these are the people who are going to be. Um, normally located within hospitals, sort of embedded, and will provide this service, and will have a have a far, you know they will be specialists for these kinds of cases, um, and you know things like because of concerns about contamination initially, things like well if a set you know if we're waiting for an FME then they might come you know in a day day's time depending on their GP surgery or whatever where we can have an embedded. Uh, nurse who can perform this examination more or less instantaneously. So, um, so this is a, a predominantly North American phenomenon. Um, so it, we really developed in, in uh, North America, and then the International Association of Forensic Nursing has really developed out of that. In England, um, so the United Kingdom Association of Forensic Nurses, uh, UCAFN, um, exists, and they've been uh, promoting a similar uh, role. Um, in England and Wales. Um, SARCs now have uh, forensic nurse examiners and they were being introduced when I, I did that study in, in early 2010. Um, there's been a little bit of, it's been a bit of a rocky road, um, their intervention, um, their introduction. I mean, it's still somewhat contentious in certain places. Um, but but there's, uh, there's, there's a lot more, I think there'll be a lot more to be said, uh, a lot more work to be done about the way that they roll out and the way they work with doctors. One of the things that I was beginning to find was there was a tension about what happens if cases go to court. Um, if a forensic nurse examiner has uh, performed the, the intervention and then an ex, a, a doctor provides the expert testimony, um, is there one of the things that can be challenged on, of course, is, well, you, you did not perform the examination. So how can you speak expertly about that case? So so there was all kinds, which which actually worked back and produced some rather difficult um, interactions between the expert and the nurse and about the kinds of practices that they could then, were then required to do, reducing the space for discretion because the expert at the end would then be asked, could be asked about anything and because they hadn't seen the, the, the victim themselves, um, the, 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 they were putting pressure on the nurse to record much more in, information. So they had everything to be able to speak expertly, which you know removed the scope for some discretionary activities of the kinds we were talking about earlier. So, so there's interesting things. I think it's very much still a developing process um, and... Um, and yeah, we will see. We'll see where that these, this goes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this brings up very interesting questions about the role of expert and expertise within law. But you know, I think a, a, one of the real important areas that you and some of the people you've already mentioned, some of the scholars you've already mentioned, have really made a, a, a incredible impact on, is your focus on technologies. And I think in particular, in your case, um, technologies of visualization and problematizing visualization technologies within sexual assault um, examinations. And I'm sure the people listening would just like to hear something about your critique 
of that aspect of examination or that aspect of medical legal um, intervention? Yeah, well, it goes back exactly to that narrative we were talking about, about the, the binary, um, because I think something like the colposcope is exactly where this performance of the of, of how one sits, where where or one community of practitioners sits in relation to evidence the therapeutic, really is where where it's embodied almost, where where this performance is 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 made very explicit. So if we go to the the introduction, so the the colposcope was a pediatrics technology, still regularly used in in, in pediatrics, uh, and the argument was made in adult sexual assault interventions uh, towards the again late 1970s. Um, that actually, because of the uh, visualization, the, the ability to micro microscopically observe the anagenital area, um, then we could generate far greater evidence. And it was sort of uh, flagged up as a really useful intervention um, because it would be able to, you know, really microscopically observe uh, injuries uh, in the anagenital region and record them and then use them as evidence. The response from the forensic medical community was actually this is abhorrent um, and the language of the second rape was actually mobilized quite frequently against it. So really for, for a, quite a, an apolitical, passive kind of group, this became a very, very, you know, a real, real hill to die on. Um, really antagonistic set of debates played out um, around whether this was a this, you know, and on this evidential therapeutic binary. So one, some were arguing for evidence, some were arguing for uh, better therapeutic care. Now, the intervening period, even up until quite recently, um, the last sort of five, ten years, um, there's still been a great level of debate around whether this technology should be applied routinely or not. I mean, so one of the arguments for it um, is that actually it's a great training tool um, because you can use this because of the recording. You may not put it into court, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but we can now do um, peer review on each other's work because we can like collectively take the recordings and, and within the medical, our local medical community, we can start saying, well, that person may, is missing things and needs more training. So, so there's a sort of training end to it that seemed to be quite positive. Um, there's, uh, but the the real problem is that within the sort of 20 to 30 years that this has been debated, is there's methodologically been a lot of um, weak studies, um, where one of the key problems is how do you identify a correct case. Um, so if the if you are, uh, have a set of recordings um, of uh, genital injury, how do you determine whether a case is a true case or not a true case? Which, which pile does it go into? Um, and of course, if you're relying on judicial outcome, then you've, you're throwing a whole lot of other problems and concerns into the mix as well. There could be many reasons why a case is marked as a, a as, as is dismissed or does not reach trial or uh, is found not guilty, regardless of whether that was a sexual violation or not. So, so there's a huge methodological weakness in identifying what constitutes um, uh, a, a case of sexual violation using this technology. And of course, because of the level of microscope, micros microscopy, I suppose it would be the right term, um, you're also introducing a range of physical phenomena that are absolutely normal um, in the anagenital region. Micro abrasions are often used to describe this by the community. You know, can you adequately discriminate between micro abrasions and, and another kind of uh, more advanced injury, etc.? So um, rather than providing greater certainty, um, the introduction of the colposcopes actually produced far greater uncertainty um, into forensic medicine. Um, and, and so what I was finding is that the local communities um, of practitioners were basically finding ways to get the absolute benefits from the, the most benefits from the device 
at the greatest at the lowest cost. So um, communities had to decide who would get to see the visualization recordings. Do they go into court? I mean, so Scotland, for instance, had made a decision. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service had agreed with the forensic medical community there that no way were these ever going to be shown in the courtroom. Um, whereas in England and Wales, no similar agreement had been reached. So there needs to be discussions about how these images are used. You know, is it sufficient just to show the defence barrister, the defence expert, the corposcopic recording? What about uh, the storage of this material? This could be, you know, uh, a very expensive, um, data-intensive set of materials that need to be covered. Um, do we ask, cons you know, obviously we ask consent, but how often, um, uh, when, you know, when, what type of cases do you use this on? What does it demonstrate? What does it mean? So there needs to be this real clear management of this device by the community, which goes integ integrally to the performance of this uh, evidential therapeutic spectrum, because how what how they answer those questions will necessarily determine their approach to uh, to take to sorry to, to victims to survivors um, to the case etc. So so it's it's a really interesting area to take a look at these technologies to be able to see to, to answer the kinds of questions we we've been talking about. Look, Gethin, I mean, anyone listening to you, it's just so incredibly interesting. And I encourage people to go to your website, read some of your stuff, because there's such a lot there. And we haven't even touched on the fascinating work you've done on sleep and sexual assault. But just before we finish, I just want to ask one final question, because I know that there are people who will be watching um, this little film who are um, early career, perhaps, and thinking, actually, this is really, really fascinating. I'd love to explore this in greater depth. What kind of advice would you give such um, such people who are enthused by your, your words and your ideas? <laughs> um, well, the first thing, um, and I, I say this a lot with uh, PhD students who come to me, master students who want to go on to do a PhD student with me. I mean, you, this, this is going to be a bumpy ride. I mean, this is not something you could, this isn't an area of study where you can say this isn't going to be, have an impact on my social, sexual relationship life. It's it's absolutely going to hit home and have some home truths. Um, and you have to be prepared for that. I was very much uh, awoken to problems with the way that um, culture had taught me to be a man the way the culture had taught me to seek out sexual uh, practices, et cetera. And that, that really hit home. Um, and so, and that had, uh, fortunately, my, my, uh, my partner at the time, now my wife, uh, was very understanding, very thoughtful, very, very sympathetic and very considerate um, at the time um, when I was very first getting into this. So that's absolutely the first thing to say, that this is not going to be something, it's not going to be five o'clock, on a Friday, you switch off. I mean, you'll be carrying the things you read, your interview data, your documents, your the, the, the things that appear in all the materials that you're working with, with you. Um, and, and finding safe support, working with supervisors. Um, you know, supervisors have got pretty good as well about identifying trigger signs uh, and print things like that, but to know about that material. Um, Concept, so that's absolutely the first thing I always say to home about. Really, um, really important. Uh, um, can, conceptually, it's about, again, finding, and this is about any topic um, that somebody's looking at, finding that thing that punches you in the gut, um, that, that is going to have an impact um, culturally, um, that's going to do something because there are days, there are lots of times in any project um, when you absolutely don't want to do it anymore and you want to throw the whole thing in the bin and you never, you just want to turn your back on the whole thing. And having that at the end, there is that person who's going to have a slightly better time because of what I'm doing, or there is that group who's going to have a slightly better time. That's, that's what got me through the PhD. Look, this, this is really words of wisdom there. And I hope that people do, you know, look up 
think about these issues. These are so important to all of us. Um, and thank you so much, Geth and Reese, for coming and, and taking time to speak to us today, particularly because I know this is a really busy time in your sort of calendar. So thanks very much. And we look forward to carrying on the conversation another time. Bye. Thanks for having me.